It is a gorgeous spring morning, isn't it? I'm more than ready for this. I, uh, or I should say we are, going to do something we haven't done for a little while around here. Um, we have our small groups that meet. That's how this ministry got started, was with a small group ministry. And uh, we put together this, we call it our program. Okay, it's got our steps on it. And for every one of our small groups, this is the format that we use. So today we're gonna um, we're gonna start the sermon off here, kind of like we start our small groups off during the week. So if everybody, if you don't have one share, because we don't have a ton of them, um, what we're gonna do on the front page, we're gonna everybody's gonna read with me beginning prayer. Real short. Father God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your saving grace. We come together in the hope of getting to know you better. We come together in the hope of healing. We call on your presence. Pray for your blessing. And we do all this in the name of Jesus Christ. And then our opening statement says, having continued in our addictions to the point of hopelessness and despair, we came to the realization that we needed help. While some of us might be seeking help for the first time, many of us have a long history of struggling with these challenges. Aware of this need for help and knowing that our help needed to come from outside ourselves, we considered the importance of a higher power, believing that our choice in that higher power was absolutely critical to our success. Boom. <laughs> um, we decided to consider Jesus as that power. If you want what we have and are simply willing to consider Jesus as your higher power, then here are the steps we recommend. Step one, we recognize that our lives have become a prison, or a man is a slave to whatever is mastering. 2 Peter 2.19. Step two, we consider that, excuse me, we consider the fact that, are, that it might be the sin in our lives that cause a lack of freedom. I tell you the truth, everyone who is a sin is a state of sin. John 8, 34. Step three, <coughs> we consider accepting Jesus as our higher, Jesus Christ as our higher power. But if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, Step four, we prayerfully asked him to take away the desire to continue in this activity that separates, separates us from him. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, Philippians 4, 6. Step five, we sought through prayer and study in our small groups his healing gospel truth. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all things will be given to you as well. Matthew 6, 33. Step 6. We came to accept him as our Lord and Savior. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. John 8, 32. Step 7. We share this message of grace. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Matthew 28, verses 19. Thanks, you guys. <coughs> Step seven. We got seven simple little steps here that take us from realizing I've got a problem here into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take the next couple months, whenever it's okay, whenever I can. I'm gonna I'm gonna preach through the steps. We haven't done that in a while. Today, obviously, step one. We recognized that our life had become a prison. And that doesn't just mean alcohol, that doesn't mean drugs. You know what it means. Anything that we put in front of our relationship with Jesus Christ. But today we look at this recognition that uh, my way's not working real well here. 
And I want to make it practical and, and tie a couple of, of topics into the message that I believe are very pertinent for men that are coming through uh, the homes. Okay? So this isn't going to be your typical, hopefully, I like to consider myself a one-point preacher. This is not a one-point message today, okay? Um, but it's going to combine step one. Okay, I recognize things have gone south here. But when we talk about prisons, folks, I think one of the greatest prisons that we have in our lives is the word fear. Okay? Uh, I think half of the stuff that troubles us is about fear. I think fear is almost the very opposite of the word love. I really do. So, uh, we're going to combine step one with the word fear. And, you know, I guess I would ask the question then, right now. What is it that you fear the most? What is it in your heart, in your mind, that you spend time on? In fear. And I want to pull this back to step seven now, because we get, you know, we, that's a great step for us who've been struggling with drugs and alcohol, all right? That's bondage. Some of us have come to step seven from prison itself. We got crazies today talking about that. But what happens so often at step seven is we see, we see guys get turned on for the Lord but then it gets a little scary because they start to drift away and they forget that that's the, that's the priority, is to keep Jesus the priority, okay? And one of the biggest red flags that we see at step seven, when someone might be headed in a bad direction, it's not when we talk about fear here, it's the fear of money, okay? Stuff. That's what I think a bunch of you just answered when I asked that question. Simple message. Step one. Fear. Stuff. Okay? Money. Let's have a, let's have a prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord. Love you. And uh, just call on your presence, Lord. I thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. And I just uh, would ask right now, Lord, that you would... Uh, you would speak through me. Please use me now. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you think about it, if you were to ask the question, what does is, what is Jesus teach the most on? Or maybe, before going to that question, what is the question, or what is his statement that he says more than anything? I tell you the truth. What's that? I tell you the truth. That's a great one, Travis. I might have just, huh? Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. Over and over and over again, he tells us to fear not. Brian read the, the verses of the day a minute ago in Philippians uh, chapter 4, one of my favorite books in Scripture, probably the most loving book you'll find in Scripture. But in the middle of that, he said, well, verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about most stuff. Some things. No. Do not be anxious about anything. Fear not. You know, I was talking with a friend of mine the other day and um, who's had issues with, with drugs and alcohol and imprisonment. And, and he, mentioned to, he mentioned to me that he's just trying to catch up right now. He's just trying to catch up. And that's, that's not the way it works, folks. Okay? We need to keep our eyes focused on here and everything else will fall into place, okay? I promise you that. 
and you know, when I, I talk about money, um, I grew up here in Denver. I went to Cherry Creek High School, which is a pretty hoity-toity school, okay? A lot of money. Um, it's interesting, though, because where I grew up, I grew up over in Southeast Denver, right at the corner of, of Hampton and University, right next door to Welsher Golf Course. I, I know every blade of grass on that course. Um, but it's a funny little situation right there. That I lived on the northwest side of the very busy intersection right there. And that was, that was Cherry Creek School District. But we grew up, I grew up very comfortable, you know, a little three-bedroom tri-level. Nothing special. Started out in Catholic school, but then ended up going to Cherry Creek. But I just had a, a simple lifestyle. But right across the street, if you just go south, you find yourself instantly in Cherry Hills Village, okay? And um, there's one area right there that's called Sunset Drive. And I mean, that's some of the nicest real estate in all of Colorado. And my buddies all lived over there, okay? It was, it was great. I, uh, you know, I'd go home and man, I'd throw my books down and I'd be on my way to Preston's house. He's got a, Racquetball court in his basement, you know. Um, the point, though, is, you know, 40, 50 years later, I've seen more devastation come from some of my older buddies and the curse that their love of money had brought into their lives. And I mean that. Um, sometimes the worst thing that can happen to a young man is to walk into a big fat inheritance. I've seen that over and over again. You know, we mentioned also that Jesus continually tells us to fear not. Fear not. And you know, I, I, the more I read it, it makes me think, wow. You know, I long to be obedient. I want to be obedient. To live in, in fear is not only unfaithful, it's halfway disobedient, isn't it? We're given a spirit of power. I do want to read, turn to Exodus, please. I do want to read a couple quick verses. Exodus 14. And we've read this verse more than a couple times. From up here. <coughs> Exodus 14, and I'm going to start in verse 13. We have the story of Moses and the Hebrew nation. They're trapped. They're trapped between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army. And I, this verse just does so much for me. Um, or these verses, I should say. Verse 13. Moses answered the people, Do not what? Be afraid. Boom. Stand firm. And you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. <laughs> Ouch. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. I mean, how relaxing is that, you guys? What more do you need to hear? Huh? I need only to be still. He will fight for me. Turn to, a bit to your right, 1 Samuel 17. story of uh, David and, and Goliath here. And uh, who can tell me what the Valley of Elah is? No, right? <laughs> I can show you a picture. 
I was checking yesterday on the high man right there. The Valley of Elon. Go ahead, Brian. It's what you, what's the question? <laughs> what is what happened at the Valley of Elon? Oh, it's, uh, the Philistine army was up on one, and then the other right. Israelite and Saul and Goliath and David came around and yeah. was introduced. Good stuff. I'll read. Uh, I'll start in forty-five. And this is David, who's a boy, okay, talking to a monster of a man, all right? Verse 45, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's. And he will give all of you into our hands. Okay. Maybe my favorite story in scripture. Here we have this young boy who's been anointed king, but he hasn't taken the throne. Willing to take on this, this giant of a man. And, you know, the, the fact is, is he's talking to him, but he's also talking, there's a lot of people around here, okay? The, the Philistines, he's addressing them here also, okay? And this <coughs> young boy, you talk about fighting words. Huh? I mean, this. I mean, this day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. He tells us. Isn't that amazing? And you know what? And then he says, and you know, all of you people that are on his side, you got some problems too. Okay? This is bold, but the beauty of it, and what I want to tie into here is once again, like in Exodus fourteen fourteen. You need only to be still. Notice how he finishes up here. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's. And he will give all of you into our hands. Now I can't wait to meet King David. I've got so many. I want to hear the stories he's got to tell me. Um, you know, uh, last month Brian and I... We're, we're over in Israel. And uh, I actually brought, I got a couple of props, and I never do that. I don't even use PowerPoint, you know, but I've actually got some props today, guys. When we were uh, in Israel, we, uh, I think it was the same day, did we go to the garden tomb and all, or to, to the valley? Yeah. Same day, wasn't it? Yeah. We started the day out at the garden tomb, and it was, it was a chilly, rainy morning, and we went to this garden tomb, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful location. And um, at, the end of, at the end of going and seeing the tomb, we all kind of met in this little alcove that they had set up for us, and there was probably about 25, 28 people in there, and we shared our stories about, you know, our, our trip. And it was really powerful. But what was the most powerful was at the end of everybody's discussion, we celebrated communion at this location. I mean, just it was very powerful. I mean, very powerful. And, and I took this home, and it's the little chalice that I got my, my juice in. And I look at this, and I've got it sitting on my desk right I look at this, and I just simply say, his blood. His blood. Cool thing is, and this is going to just, this is absolutely amazing. Okay. Um, we went to the Valley of Elah, where you're, you're right there. Okay, there's, you, can, you can see this thing taking place. And down at the bottom of the, of the valley there, there's a small riverbed. It's not very big at all. That's where this all went down. Okay. 
right there in the in the Valley of Eli. And Brian and I are standing in this place a few weeks back. And it was just like, wow. But something special happened. I said a really strong prayer, you know, one of those pastoral prayers. Okay. And uh, I was I was seeking guidance. I was seeking guidance because I was going to go get a stone and take it with me. So I wanted to, I wanted to get the stone. There it is, guys. <laughs> I present to you the stone that killed Goliath. <laughs> Do you buy that? But you know, that's all fine and dandy and a lot of, you know, a lot of fun. But the fact is, is I, I've got this sitting on my desk right now. And I look at it and I say, his blood. I put this in there and I finish it off by saying, his battle. Okay? I, uh, I want to finish. Um, turn to Second Timothy. Especially when we read verses like Exodus 14, 14 and 1 Samuel 7. It's time for us to let that stuff go. It's time for us to get our priorities straight. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 1. And here comes that word love. This, I just love this. It's, it's for God did not give us a spirit. Oh, chapter verse 7. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Okay? And then please turn to 1 John 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. You know, a day's coming when he's coming to take me home, and everything will change at that point, I know. And I'll not be perfect, you know, in this world. That doesn't mean I don't want to try. Okay, that's my standard. Jesus is my standard. And it says here, the one who fears is not made perfect in love. That tells me if I've got some kind of fear at all for whatever going on within me, somewhere within me also, I'm lacking some love. Fear... Cast it out, you guys. Um, one last verse, and it's the last time I'll make it, I promise. Isaiah. Isaiah 52. <coughs> this 
This one seals the deal for me. Isaiah 52, I'm going to read verse 12. But you will not leave in haste or go in flight, for the Lord will go before you. The God of Israel will be your rear guard. Okay. That adds a whole other layer for me. It tells me that the Lord will go before me. How comforting is that? Okay. But what does this verse also say? He's got my back. Okay. And folks, he tells us over and over and over again to fear not. Let's uh, let's wrap it up here. I'm going to read the closing statement on the back of. Once again, if you want what we have, we simply ask that you consider Jesus as your higher power and that you please come back. We have found that recovery is done best in a loving, supportive small group. We look forward to serving you in that process. Let's all please join in the reading of the full serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the family of Jesus, taking as Jesus did the simple world as it is, not as I have, trusting that you will make all things right when I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life, and supremely happy with you forever and the next. Amen. Amen and amen. Thanks for coming, everybody.